Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Thanks for making it today. Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, Kevin, our co-founder, as always. My third uh, time here. <laughs> yeah, you're regular now. Yes. And uh, we have Dion. Hello. And uh, Dion is our SVP of product management. And Dion had a lot of experiences in both Silicon Valley as well as in Africa. Correct. All related to product management and product managers. So. Today, we're going to talk about, the topic of today's discussion is, is product management. The title of our podcast is Great Product Managers and How to Find Them, mm-hmm. All right? Fantastic. Product. Sorry, fantastic product right. managers and how to find them. Correct, mm-hmm. correct. Um, and on that point, you know, I think I wanted to start, first of all, by kind of demystifying what product management is. I feel like there are a lot of misconceptions about what it is. Um, and that, in fact, it is one of the, say, six crafts mm-hmm. in uh, uh, um, you know, technology companies, software technology companies that are most kind of predominant. And this, those six crafts are uh, software engineering, uh, research, design, uh, data scientist, um, product management, of course. And what am I missing here? Well, there's a there's a subset that of or a subset of data scientists sometimes that uh, are just specifically for analysis work. So analysts, right. analysts. That's yeah. right. The analyst uh, uh, craft. And so we're talking one out of these six crafts, which is product management. And so let's go a little bit deeper about what it is and what it is not. Mm-hmm. First of all, mm-hmm. you guys want to kickstart? Sure. Um, Why sure. Don't you start, Pete? Okay. Well, um, we call product managers PMs for short. A lot of the time, right? Yes. And that often gets miscon- misconstrued as project management, and people use that interchangeably. And I think while there's quite a bit of overlap in skill sets between project managers and product managers, there are inherently two different roles. A lot of product managers are excellent project managers, mm-hmm. right? And I think there needs to be um, good project management skills to be uh, an effective product manager, but they are not the same roles. Okay. Can you explain that? Like, what is the fundamental difference between yeah. a project manager and a product manager? And in my mind, and in our frameworks here at Gojek, when we describe the difference between the two, is I think uh, with program and project managers, you know, you're, the product that you're building is you know for the customers within the company, right? Like you're managing delivery timelines, you're figuring out problems internally, and you're delivering projects. For products, uh, right, for product managers, you're doing this for the end customers. It could be the merchants that we're building for, uh, our riders, right, our drivers, but inherently you're building products for end customers. Mm -hmm. And you're also, you know, responsible for delivering those um, products on time, sometimes with the help of a dedicated project manager. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So your primary stakeholder, your North Star, your, you know, Mecca Mm -hmm. is the customer. Right? Correct. Is, is someone that is outside yep. of your organization. Whereas yep. a program manager and project manager, it may not be the case. Yep. Exactly. Okay. okay. And specifically, we're talking about, in this case, software products, right? Correct. That's, that's when we say product management within tech. It's Correct. within that scope. Okay. What are some of the, the things that may be a misconception in the market about what product manager? One is that they are a project manager. Yep. So they're doing something with the timeline, but they're not mm-hmm. in charge and they're not actually uh, paying homage to their final stakeholder, which is the end user. Mm-hmm. Right? You've already stated mm-hmm. that. Are there any other kind of misconceptions about when people say product manager or product management? I think uh, it's worth spending time to talk about that specific, I think, common mis- misconception. Okay. Uh, because it's actually a fairly common one. Um, and, and, and you see... Uh, you see it happen in in certain companies uh, where the 
product manager is essentially just in charge of a Gantt chart or like just a set of delivery timelines and say, okay, by this date, you have to deliver X. By that date, you have to deliver Y. Uh, and it's just this constant like rolling schedule of just things that you have to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, they're being evaluated on their ability to deliver uh, those time. things on time. Right? Is that what is generally called to be a feature factory? <laughs> well, is that what you just described? Well, 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 some companies, you know, run their product organizations like feature factories, and it is it, it's probably one of the symptoms, right, of of, of, of you know feature factory type uh, uh, products or companies. But um, there are companies that don't necessarily run like uh, feature factories, but that still have product man managers essentially act like project managers, right? So the folks who can kind of estimate and, and, and deliver on time are considered the ones who are doing well in their job. Um, and if they don't, then they aren't considered doing well. And, 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 and to Dee's earlier point, there is a part of the skill set that is about delivering stuff on time, right? There needs to be a certain level of accountability for the predictability of when things are going to ship uh, to the customer. But um, I think the, 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 the point around the North Star is really that customer, right? Like, like I think that's the, the, the common misconception around project management. I mean, the product management that ends up being boiled down to project management is that there isn't the focus on delivering something to the customer that solves the customer problem. Mm. Right? So even if you deliver a bunch of stuff on time, if you don't solve a customer problem, then you're not, you, sh you, you shouldn't be considered doing your job well as a product manager because at the end of the day, uh, it's all about solving the customer problem. And so the way that you, one should kind of evaluate a product manager is, is really around like how well are they solving that customer problem. And there's many ways we can define solving a customer problem well. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a really critical misconception, right? That's a really interesting point because, you know, I feel like the differentiator there is the level of autonomy that the product manager has. So am I correct to say that if that product manager or the so-called product manager is basically getting assigned features that is given by, let's say, the CEO or the founder, mm. right? Say, do this, 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 and I want you to make it on time. Then that person is actually not performing a product management role. Is no, that correct? That, that's, that's correct. That's right? correct. Because also, there's also no accountability. Because if the things don't work or they're not solving the, the problem, the customer problem, then whose fault is it mm -hmm. really, right? Mm. And I think said another way, which I like to... Um, like to do is that you as a product manager, you're not just in charge of, you know, finding and building solutions. You're also prioritizing like the problems to solve, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not just delivering the solutions on time, right? You are making sure that you are delivering the best possible solutions for the customer and actually delivering value. But I think when you abstract away even more, I think a good product manager doesn't jump straight to the solution. You're thinking about, okay, what are the most important problems to solve for the customer, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, here's a bunch of ideas, you're thinking, okay, what am I actually trying to solve? And then you derive, derive the ideas and solutions from there. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, so so a product manager is, should, the scope of a product manager, a good product manager, should not simply be the solution to the problem. It is the definition of the problem itself, mm -hmm. the one step before that, that is mm -hmm. even more critical. Mm -hmm. And that's really what separates the average to the good product managers. Like, let's not even talk mm -hmm. about good to great yet, because that's, that's, that's another topic. I think we should, we should move on after this. But the baseline, mm -hmm. what, what makes you a really good product manager is being able to identify and constantly question mm -hmm. the, the problem itself. And whether or not you're actually solving the most important problem for the customer and the business right now. Because, and I think another question I like to ask is, you know, it's not, it's very easy to say, yes, this is an important problem to solve, but it's harder to justify, like, why solve this problem now versus everything else, mm -hmm. right, that you could be solving? Why is this important to do right now mm -hmm. relative to everything else? I think that is also another way to look at whether or not a product manager has reached a certain level of maturity. Oh, that seems like a really huge amount of responsibility, Dian, right, for product manager. Yep. <laughs> um, no so, pressure, right? I mean, so then... What is the relationship of that product manager? Who, who does a product manager report to? 
right? If you, if you are supposed to be in charge of that entire problem set, whatever scope you define it, because you can have multiple problems, right? Mm -hmm. Multiple products in yep. an organization, you can split it. But who should be the product manager's boss? It, that's a very hard question to answer, I think. And one, we have not you know, completely figured out a cut and dry answer to even here at Gojek, right? Mm. Um, it really, I've seen this vary across different types of companies and different sizes of companies. Um, I've seen uh, product managers at very small startups report directly to the CEO. I myself as a product, I guess, director have reported directly to the CIO, who is also overseeing not just product management, but IT and data, right? What's and, CIO, and engineering, which chief information, information okay. officer, not innovation. Okay. Yeah. Information. Correct. Information. Interesting. Um, I have seen in other models, you know, if a product is in charge of a suite or portfolio or group of products uh, that also have a business counterpart, them actually reporting to the business kind of GM role, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, you have a chief product officer overseeing all the all the different uh, product portfolios. Mm -hmm. I've also seen that model. Is there such a thing as a, a kind of a limit to how big a product should be and should have a product manager? Like, is there like a minimum size or a maximum size? How do you start deciding how many product managers you should have in your organization? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a massive problem that we face in Gojek mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have the exact answer, but how should we start thinking about this? About mm -hmm. should you have groups of what we have in some some of our organizations mm -hmm. is group PMs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where it's kind of like a, a higher level PM that under them are a few PMs, yep. right? But where does that unit stop? Should we just continue to split products again and split products again and then you have junior PMs underneath PMs, right? And then maybe mm -hmm. junior, junior PMs underneath. Where does that stop? Where does that unit say we say, no, we should stop. This is the level that we wanna have a product manager at and then not break it down anymore and also vice versa. How much can we group together, mm -hmm. product managers? So I'm talking about the org now. Yep. Hmm. This is a really good one. Uh, I think there's a few ways of looking at this, and Kevin, feel free to mm -hmm. chime in. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Uh, one measuring stick I have is um, the number of developers or engineers that you have. I think there is a healthy ratio uh, that is manageable for a product manager for delivering software products and how many engineers are on that team or stream. I find in my experience that one product manager to four to six to eight max engineers, I think, is a reasonable ratio, depending on how experienced you are as a PM, right? Anything I think under four or five developers per PM, you actually you know, don't have enough developers, I think, to support um, the stream, whereas like anything beyond eight or nine engineers per PM, it starts getting very difficult for the PM to keep up with the pace and velocity of the engineering team. Mm. So that's one measuring stick that, that I have. What, what Kevin used to tell me in the beginning of the day, there was this theory about the team of five, um, meaning no teams. This was specifically in engineering. Specifically. Right, right, like we right. should have no bigger teams than five. You want to talk a little bit about that and how that relates to that product management unit and why there's this magic number of five that well, it, you, shouldn't, yeah. you shouldn't go beyond? Well, I, think it, I think it's more of a principle and a guideline than, than a hard and fast rule. But uh, as Dian mentioned, I think we, when, you, when you get enough, when, um, when you have a, a too large of a team uh, doing something, it ends up becoming the, the, the management overhead uh, starts becoming uh, significant enough that you spend less time thinking about the problem and more time managing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that... Boy, do we know that. Yes. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. definitely do, right? And, 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 and there, there's nothing necessarily wrong with spending more time managing than, than executing. But when you're trying to ship products out uh, to the customer, um, that thinking time is something that is necessary uh, uh, to, to, to have, obviously, to prioritize the right problems to solve and, and, and have the right solutions uh, to, to those problems. So I think just having those smaller teams allow you to kind of have that ratio of like managing to actually thinking about problems and executing on that problem uh, uh, in a productive, uh, in a productive way. And I think the other, but the other, the other thing that I kind of think about when 
structuring product teams is that it, one is yes, there's a function of like what is the talent that you have available, right? Like when you, how many people do you have? How long will it take to onboard new people? Um, and also, you know, given where we are in the world right now, uh, the availability of experienced engineers and product managers. So I think there's a lot of things that kind of go into what the ideal team size is that, you know, isn't just about a, an ideal theory, but, but also about availability. Um, but if one can be just like ideal, ideal, I mean, for, for me, Ideally, and, and, and I have, I, I, it's not universal, there's some disagreements I have with, with people on this, but uh, for me, I would actually like to boil down the, the smallest unit of user experience, ideally to a small team. Mm -hmm. So uh, in an ideal world, in, in an ideal world where there are uh, a lot, there's a lot of availability of talent, right? And what, what would be an example in Gojek? Okay, um, hmm. so, for example, um, when you order food or when you order a ride, uh, there's an animation of a driver that kind of animates towards the pickup. Right? Yep. And the live tracking. Yes, the live. Yes, what we call live tracking. Um, in my view, like if we had enough people, I would love to have just one pod of PMs, engineers, and designers just working on that. Right. One PM. Right. Yes. A pod means a one PM, mm -hmm. few engineers, mm -hmm. and a designer. Yeah. That's a unit. Yeah. Maybe a data scientist. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, and and it, they're there to solve one specific customer problem, which is actually to give the customer a sense of assurance uh, and reduce the anxiety uh, of you know when is this driver going to show up at the pickup or the drop off mm -hmm. right uh, and so you define that customer problem which is you know around information uh, uh, information availability uh, around transparency and predictability um, and then you say okay you know have a crack at how to communicate this information of where somebody is in relation to what the customer wants to do mm. right so yep. that ideally that's what you know should happen but in our, because we have a lack of uh, enough PMs and engineers, then we kind of abstract it even higher and say, oh, we have a PM and a set of engineers and a designer and data scientist to solve the pickup experience, mm -hmm. right? So the pickup experience is even broader, right? It's not just about communicating information to the customer on you know where this driver is. It's also about the physical, like how does a driver and a, and a, and a customer meet uh, how uh, how do we provide uh, uh, predictability around you know when they're going to show up? Uh, how do we create easier ways for a user to select where exactly they want to pick up? Right. So the the problem becomes bigger. Right? I, li I like that you've. So it's it's again whenever in doubt about how to scope something, always go back to the consumer experience. Right. Mm -hmm. What is that kind of chunk of user experience that is similar enough that you can count as a single unit right mm -hmm. so for example that waiting till the driver gets to you that's a distinct experience mm -hmm. once the driver has picked you up mm -hmm. you're on a different stage that's right of that user experience and therefore the objective is different right. they're different mm -hmm. problems and that's where you can put a new pod with a new mm -hmm. pm mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so this is really interesting just before i want to ask you a question but before that i just wanted to make a note that that kind of magic number of five six people as a team as a as an organized pod you know, by the way, this is not a ratio or a number that is only reflected in technology or in companies. Um, you know, there's been lots and lots of articles and, and books discussing about how special operations military uh, teams are the, in Navy SEALs, for example, etc., where, where these are the optimal breakup points mm -hmm. that you can execute something in the most effective way. So there's, mm. there's many examples of yep. these pods, yep. optimal yep. pod sizes, which is really interesting. Now. We just described me that the pod, it seems like the focal point of the pod is that product manager. Mm -hmm. That product manager is the one responsible for defining, refining the problem statement, um, prioritizing the key feature sets, and somewhat project managing the execution, so the delivery. Mm -hmm. So why isn't the product manager the boss mm -hmm. of that team? Is the product manager the boss of mm -hmm. that team? Which means are those engineers should be reporting to that product manager or no? No. Are I you think, sure? Because a bunch of product managers <laughs> think that their engineers are theirs so, and they're their one downs. A lot me, of product managers. Let me get into uh, the next common misconception. Okay. I think. I think a lot of people 
feel that the job is a glamorous one where everybody reports to them, right? And you have full authority over what happens within that team. To me, that has never been the case. And the mark of a good product manager is being able to lead by influence um, and being able to persuade people um, on their team who don't necessarily report to them that in fact this is the drumbeat that they should be marching to because they do believe that it's the right customer problem to solve, right? Mm. That's another, I think, um, hard to measure um, characteristic of an excellent product manager. And in all my previous companies, none of these other functions report up to the product manager. You literally do, unless you have um, product managers as your one down. So for example, a more senior product manager having a couple of associate product managers directly reporting to them. There is no company I've worked for where the model is the other functions of that pod reporting up to the PM. Like we all lead by influence, not well, authority. Why is that? It seems like such an impractical thing. You've got, you mm -hmm. know, a, you've got a pod that has to yep. deliver for the mm -hmm. company. You're in a very competitive space. Yep. You have crazy deadlines and timelines. Yep. Why not just give full authority and power to the product manager and have all those engineers mm -hmm. or scientists or analysts report to them? What's, mm -hmm. what's wrong with that? Well, because I think ultimately that actually goes against, um, I think it disincentivizes, first of all, the product manager to think about you know whether or not this is actually the right problem to solve. It makes it too easy to say, hey, you know what? What I say is ultimately what's going to happen. So I think mm -hmm. it doesn't incentivize the right behavior. Secondly, I think because the role is multidisciplinary, right, and like the other roles within that pod are more specialized and technical, you know, the PM doesn't necessarily know like what the technical constraints are, for yep. example. They don't necessarily know what the correct methodology Most of the is. Time they're not right? even an engineer, right? No, they, and like they have never yeah. been an engineer. And yeah. even if you spend a ton of time with customers, you don't necessarily know what the correct research methodology is to like conduct you know, uh, a type of research to answer a specific type of question or what stage of the product development. Or, you know, if you're not an analyst, right, uh, you don't always know if you're like actually analyzing something correctly and like getting statistical significance. I would expect actually a good PM to do, you know, some bits of that. But, you know, all these other specialized functions are there to inform the product manager to make the best decision. So they, the PM should not have authority to tell them how to do their jobs, right? But influence them to like want to build the, the same thing together. How, how important is it to have an, on the engineering side, right? This relationship between the product manager and the engineer seems to be tantamount. This is the most important mm -hmm. relationship, right? Now, how important is it to have one person or one engineer there, what we would normally call the tech lead, mm -hmm. um, to be the counterpart of the PM on the engineering side that will then, and usually that mm -hmm. tech lead will then the engineers will report into that tech lead, but mm -hmm. he's also an engineer. So engineers mm -hmm. should always report mm -hmm. to engineers, not to product managers. Mm -hmm. So what do you what do you think about that? Do you think that's the right way of doing it? Always having a tech lead, I think an it, engineer lead. It's yeah. very helpful to have uh, a counterpart like that um, within a pod. And in the most successful, I think, pods or teams I've worked for, I have a counterpart, um, which is the tech lead. Okay, and what's that relationship like? What is, an, what is a good relationship between the tech lead and the product manager? Mm -hmm. is, is it kind of the same relationship that a CPO would have to a CTO if you take it to the company level? I How is it different? It's a good analog, I think. Um, I see them as peers. Um, I think the best relationships I've had with TLs are ones where we respect each other as peers and there's enough psychological safety to be completely transparent to each other and also call each other out, right? Same with like my design leads, right? Some of the best work I've done is when I'm actually trying to pursue one path. For example, like I'm trying to optimize a certain metric, right? So I'm like, you know, I think this is the best solution and I did a bunch of estimates. I think we're gonna be able to move this metric by this much, right? We should go for this and prioritize this in our next um, iteration. And the designer or the tech lead will challenge me saying, yes, you know, those are pretty solid estimates, but at what cost have you considered, you know, this engineering constraint? Or are you actually doing right by the customer? Have you considered these other solutions that might actually be a better customer experience, mm -hmm. right? So I think having those partners to challenge your assumptions and having a safe enough environment to uh, have those conversations is pretty critical. What do you think is the number one 
topic of conflict between the tech lead and uh, the PM. Do you want to uh, talk mm. about this a bit before I jump into I mean, you it? You have deep experience in this, Ken. <laughs> what is the, what, okay, 80% of the fights, what are they about? Mm. I think it, 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 usually when you have teams of smart people, uh, uh, it's, you don't always agree, right? And, and, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a culture where, like ours, where we encourage um, people to speak up, where we encourage um, people have, having access to research and data, the same research and data that everyone has access to, people build their own opinions, right? So I think uh, one, one particular kind of type of conflict that you see is that, in, in a way, uh, an, an engineer uh, 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 might see uh, the customer problem you know, totally differently based on the same set of information or different you know, adjacent like, sets of information and think that you know, the product manager um, is not actually solving the problem or prioritizing the right problem. And then you end up with a, a situation where um, there is a bit of a deadlock, right? Where um, engineer says, hey, this is the right customer problem to solve. We should work on this and here's why I think that and the product manager will think something else, and you end up in a, in a fairly uh, uh, difficult situation because at the end of the day, it's the engineer and the engineering team that needs to build the thing, mm. right? And, 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 and because it's a craft, right? It requires uh, um, buy-in to build the thing right. Like you, at the end of the day, you know, engineers are actually building this thing, and if they don't believe in what they're building, yeah. you know, how much of their heart and soul are they gonna put into, into, into building it? Um, how much will they you know, spend extra time thinking about how to even improve it as they're building it? Um, and, and as a result, you know, when you kind of end up in these situations and you kind of just push through, um, sometimes things aren't built you know, the right way. Um, I think that's kind of you know, one common issue uh, that, that, that happens. I think another one, uh, another one that happens I see is uh, we is usually when uh, the product manager still has somewhat of a project management type mindset where they think like, okay, you know, we want to build X and engineer says, okay, cool, I agree, let's build it. It's going to take this much time. Um, and then the, the product manager then sees his or her job as like, oh, you said it takes six weeks, uh, do it in three, right? And it, and it, kind, of, it kind of like, and, and so you end up in this like situation where uh, it's more of a negotiation, yeah. right? It becomes a negotiation of like, oh, that's the timeline. So then my job is to shorten the timeline. Um, and so you end up with also these uh, uncomfortable situations where um, the engineer feels like, you know, the product manager doesn't re realize what exactly he or she is asking, right? And so to mm -hmm. Dee's point, I think what she was alluding earlier to that you kind of have to have a little bit of understanding of every little of every discipline that you work with because oftentimes in that situation an engineer will say that makes no sense like there's no possible way we could do it there uh, in that in that time period and then you kind of end up again in a deadlock where the engineer feels like you don't know what you're talking about like uh, and then the product manager just feels like oh you just want to free up more time uh, for you to, to, to work right mm -hmm. and so sometimes there is this that comes in a kind of a low trust type mm -hmm. of uh, uh, environment. Yep. Um, and so I, I, I've also seen that uh, a decent amount of time. Well, Kev, when we got started, mm. right, if you, if you remember yeah. correctly, like we used to do that All to time. our product managers. All like the time. Crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Product managers come in and say like, okay, after lots of discussion, we think we can pull this off in like one month. No, you have one week. <laughs> yes, yeah. I yeah. gotta go now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm glad you don't do that anymore. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> we yeah. don't do that right, anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, I think that point emphasizes the importance of the confidence of the product manager. Um, the product man, a good product manager, will not only be able to get alignment in the team, um, but a good product manager because they are generally the ones that will interact with the business leadership of the organization, whether it's the group PM or the GM or the CEO or the founders, wherever. Right? Um, they will interact a lot. With, with the senior management team, I believe. And if you don't have someone with the courage to say no, mm -hmm. and the courage to defend both the tech lead, the engineering interests, or even the designer's interests mm -hmm. in their team, mm -hmm. um, then you're gonna have a really big problem. 
So like you said, a good product manager has this intrinsic, should have this intrinsic or learned capability to collaborate, but they also need this fortitude and courage to say no and to be able to rationalize and somewhat play a protective role mm-hmm. to their team, right? Yep. And that's why you really need high integrity mm-hmm. in product managers. I think mean, if I had to pick one craft out of all of those that would need the highest level of integrity, in, in my opinion, it would be the, the, the product managers. Like the threshold of our integrity is, is much, much higher, mm-hmm. I would say, than even uh, any of the other crafts. Mm-hmm. Um, so because of the vagueness of their job, right? And the complexity mm-hmm. and the interdependencies. Mm-hmm. Um, you had a point before, but I cut you off. Was that related to this? I have lost the point. Okay. It will come back if it's important. Be- because I want to have a quick discussion around uh-huh. that relationship. Like mm-hmm. we mentioned the relationship with engineering and the tech lead and the tension. I'd like to shift gear a little bit and talk with the designer. Okay. Oh. This is a really mm-hmm. interesting dynamic, mm-hmm. right? It's also timely. You know, it's happening right now. Oh. We, have, we have some uh, interesting uh, tensions. Yeah, between. interesting con- conflicts. Mm. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah. Okay. It's not sugarcoat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conflicts okay. are conflicts. Now, yeah. you, know, in, you know, there is this interesting, um, just going, taking one step back, the, the whole paradigm of the product manager function versus the engineering function, you know? There is some people who say that, you know, they're both, both of them have to look to the customer, right? They're mm-hmm. solving a customer problem, right? Uh, but if you had to kind of segment the, the element that they are accountable for, some people say that product managers are most responsible for the user experience um, of that feature or app or whatever it is. And the tech lead is responsible for the scalability and reliability of that. Now, that's slightly imperfect, yeah, yeah. but it mm-hmm. kind of gives some kind of a guidance sure. to mm-hmm. what each of them kind of are in charge of, because there needs to be some separation, right. some level of separation of accountability, right? Right. Now, what about designer and PM? First of all, what are the main fights about? What is the mm-hmm. split of responsibility between them? Why? isn't the PM the chief designer of that product, you know? Like, mm-hmm. there's the technical element, but I'm sure there's other, there's more to it. And what is that, what is a healthy working relationship between a PM and a designer, and what is an unhealthy working relationship? Mm. Well, well, the, I think one of the things that we've observed is that uh, uh, some, some PMs are more uh, design sensitive, than, than others, um, and usually the, the the tensions and conflict arise when uh, uh, PMs might be less design centric. And what that means is that um, some oftentimes when you kind of design, when designers want to build a, a help build a product, um, you know they they well as designers they try and create great designs, delightful designs, things that you know m- might be less directly kind of utilitarian like it's not just about oh um, let's say you want a search box it's just you know a box and you can put text in it right Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but designers will want to say like hey you know should uh, what should the drop down for the search box look like you know should the search box just be like a box or should it have rounded corners because that's how it fits with the rest of the aesthetic of the app and uh, uh, what happens when uh, uh, somebody in, inputs a search that doesn't work, right? Mm. Should there be something that kind of communicates uh, 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 a bad search query? Um, and somebody who's kind of a product manager that's utilitarian would just kind of like, oh, do a pop up and says your you know your search failed. Mm. Uh, so the and, and and when you have a finite amount of time and bandwidth from your engineering team, uh, there product managers that might not have more design sensitivity might just say, hey, you know, I have this much bandwidth. Why should I spend more effort on making that search effort delightful if, you know, it works? When I have a massive backlog exactly. yep. of features that I'm already behind on. Exactly, right? right? I want to I wanna do, okay, search is done. Cool, let's go move on to uh, the menu selector. Well, what we did mm. in Gojek was a pretty aggressive move. Mm. What, what me and you decided um, was we gave the lead designer of every product, 10% of engineering capacity by force. 
Yeah. You remember uh, this? That's, right. yeah, that's we just remains re- controversial. <laughs> it's very controversial. Yes. Um, so why do you think we did that? And was that, was it aggressive? Does it make sense? Or, and is that a failure on the product managers mm. of Gojek is the reason mm. why we implemented that? Mm. Uh, just to be clear, what we did was we basically said that every designer a very, that's attached to a product um, or the lead designer mm. attached to the product gets 10% say on what gets prioritized from an engineering perspective in order to create user delight. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That yeah. may have nothing to do with the OKRs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, or it could just be hygiene. Right. It doesn't even have to be delightful. It's like yeah. product debt. Yes. Yeah. Similar to tech debt. It's yes. like there is a tiny thing you want to improve that might not necessarily move a needle, but overall contributes to like a cohesiveness of the product, for example. That's right. right? Or aligning things that should look the same mm-hmm. <laughs> that are not the same, right? Yep. I can't argue that that's going to help my OKRs, yep. but it looks weird, right? Mm-hmm. It looks weird. And these kind of things don't get mm-hmm. factored out in the OKRs. Mm-hmm. I can't put on the OKR, make everything look nice because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's really hard to track, but a designer knows what nice looks like mm-hmm. and can, can defend that. Um, has that created conflict in the organization? I mean, you oh, tell me what, yeah. what, 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 what have people in, in, the, in the design team and in the product management team and the engineering team think about that 10% rule? Honestly, if it's, if it's a problem, it's the least of my worries right now. There are other fires that I think people have elevated to me more than that. So I think it, it might actually be working. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing a point, but I think it seems fine from my end. Okay. And yeah. if it's not, People should uh, talk to me about it. Right. Well, some some product managers, you know, kind of grumble a little bit. Yeah. Maybe they haven't. They. They're prioritizing they, their yeah. problems to me. Yes. As a yeah. good product manager should do. Yes. I mean, I think for me, it's more like absent, like, hey, yeah. things are that are bothering me, right? Yeah. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, some some PMs have 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 mentioned to me that, um, some PMs have mentioned that it's it might be a little bit too uh, prescriptive. Right, I think draconian. Uh, uh, that word wasn't used yet, <laughs> but uh, but but prescriptive in the sense that you know it, it shows some to some extent like a uh, like you said a lack of trust. Yeah. Right. It's like hey, like we're in charge it, of making I mean, sure it is. That's it, why yes. we did it. <laughs> right. I mean, it, and it is because like historically, I think we've we've over indexed on kind of launching things and and and, and the function uh, and the utility. Uh, rather than you know making things delightful for the user, however that's measured, if 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 even if possible, right? Um, so yeah, can you, can you talk a little bit about that about the mm. tyranny of MVP? <laughs> can you talk a little bit about yeah, how there's yeah, like yeah. a counter wave? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Happening internally, like before it's all MVP, MVP, and now there's a counter wave against the tyranny of MVP. Can you want to explain that? Yeah, I think you know. For, I think we, you know, just because everything just scaled so quickly, and and and, and we expanded into so many different types of products and businesses so quickly, that uh, kind of the the culture that was formed was just like, hey, Sorry, I just I think we need to clarify yeah. for the people that don't know what MVP means. It's minimum viable product. That's right. It is the concept of launching something that's good enough. Yeah. In order to test and then build on top of that. Right, mm-hmm. it's right. kind of this agile mindset of you know it doesn't have to be perfect. Yep. But now we have a bit of a mini revolt, a healthy revolt. It's yep. not like a negative revolt. Yep. But it's a it's a it's a healthy kind of dissenting to the MVP concept. So yeah. please continue. And 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 so because you know we we were in so many different things, and the more you kind of increase the surface area of things that we do, the longer exponentially longer the backlog then becomes. So every it's almost like you know the PMs just like okay, there's this problem. We're gonna try and solve this problem. We launch something. It seems to move metrics. Okay, cool. What's next, mm. right? And so there's always like this like constant like going from like uh, a product or feature to feature. Even though they are thinking about what's best for the user, uh, there's this quick kind of like impetus to just kind of move on to the next thing once we feel like we've kind of moved the needle significantly enough. And and I think the problem that's kind of come up and why a lot of the designers were, were upset about uh, about that was that um, they felt like product managers didn't really uh, take into account uh, going the next step and making sure that the user actually f- feels that sense of delight uh, or as you know Dian mentioned there's a certain cohesiveness to kind of how everything is put together and looks and feels 
Um, and and that you know revolt, uh, the way you put it, I would, it's, it's a bit harsh, but uh, uh, is is I think I think it's something that you know we we did welcome, right? If not, we wouldn't have kind of pushed through the idea that they have to spend you know ten percent of their time. But I think the, the again the grumbling does come from um, yeah, just like hey, like I have a limited amount of bandwidth, and you're sh- you're permanently shaving uh, 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 that bit of uh, bandwidth. Yeah, but for me. I think it also like depends on what stage of the company you're in, right? If you're if you're already a really really big company, then the damage caused by MVP, consistent MVP development, especially when it's not even a good MVP, that in itself the threshold of what is good enough to release mm-hmm. can be very wide, mm-hmm. right? And that's dangerous as well. Mm-hmm. But there is a certain level of size of a company in which you. you you can't do that anymore. Like we're not a tiny startup anymore, right? Yeah. The, our customers demand mm-hmm. a certain level of quality from us mm-hmm. every time we release something. Mm-hmm. Let's let's kind of turn a little bit into now the human, into yeah. the actual uh, product manager itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how many product manager interviews have you had in your lifetime? I've lost count. Roughly hundreds. Probably like in the like hundred ish that's a lot you know been doing this for 10 years that's way more than me (laughs) so tell me what are you looking for oh first of all let's do this Mm -hmm. what are your red flags when you're interviewing a product manager what are your red flags um i think if communication in the interview is a problem right if this person can't articulate clearly mm-hmm. ideas or concepts that he's trying to get through to me that's a red flag because I think being able to communicate your ideas uh, and customer problems and other kinds of problem statements and then how are you going to solve them that's that's something you need to do even if it's like at a feature level right mm-hmm. so if you're having trouble answering my questions in an interview because you can't articulate ideas that's a pretty big red flag and for me like when you say communicating articulation is kind of like a big thing mm-hmm. like what is it about com- the communication part that matters most is it is it clarity of con- concepts is it mm-hmm. structured communication bottom you know like pyramid principle communication mm-hmm. like what what are you looking for in that communication piece um a, a few parts i think the structure of their answers, right? Being able to like break their answer down into a structured way that I can follow, that's mm-hmm. one. Um, active listening is another one, right? If I'm asking, you know, a couple of specific questions and they kind of go off on a completely different tangent and aren't checking themselves and I have to really pull them back, mm-hmm. that's sort of a red flag for me because that means you're not necessarily listening to what I'm saying, right? You're just kind of talking over me and that's a red flag for me. In any role, really, because right. I, I look for communication as a kind of a core value for me. I've, I've rarely found people who communicate very concisely and structurally that aren't actually good active listeners. It's weird. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's a lot of good talkers. Mm-hmm. Good talkers, there's a lot of good talkers who are mm-hmm. really crap at listening. Mm-hmm. But there's a difference between someone who's good at talking and polished mm-hmm. to being a structured communicator, mm-hmm. right? This is a big difference. Mm-hmm. You can have the most introverted person be the most incredible. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think in Gojek there are many more mm-hmm. introverts who are excellent and concise communicators mm-hmm as opposed to the extroverts who are mm-hmm. very salesy or polished, mm-hmm. but actually are not as good at structured communication. Mm-hmm. But I like your point about active listening. That's mm-hmm. also one of my things that I look for in general. Mm-hmm. But those seem to be generic, you know? Like, I feel yeah. like those two are yeah. super important for every role. Mm-hmm. What specifically in product management, because I asked mm-hmm. what your red flags are, yep. right? So yep. are there any other red flags? Yeah, specific like, to product managers, I think when even after coaching um, in the interview, for example, I'm like, okay, I'm nudging you towards a certain type of answer. They're still not getting it, um, specifically around when they're just always jumping to solutions, right? And I'm like, Mm. what's the problem you're trying to solve? Can Mm. you, and I'm nudging them in that direction without explicitly asking them like, hey, what is the problem, right? Because then it's easy, right? That means they're not thinking about the problem, right? That they're trying to solve. What's a business problem you're trying to solve? 
what's the customer problem you're trying to solve? And if all you're doing is just like giving me a bunch of features and ideas and solutions without clearly articulating to me what problem you're actually trying to solve and how you're going to measure it, that's a pretty red flag for me. If it's an interview for, I think, not an entry level position, right? Because right. I think it is a very common thing to just like, hey, product, I'm designing products and features. You know, early in my career, that was how I treated products as well, because I was working on individual features. People explained the, pro- the problem I was trying to solve, and then I would figure out the best solutions, right? So that's fine at certain levels. So it really depends on what level I'm interviewing for, too. That's really interesting. There's this, you know, really popular book uh, by Daniel Kahneman called Think Fast, Think Slow. Mm -hmm. And I I feel like for for product managers, the ability to think slow Mm -hmm. um, is one of the biggest advantages. Mm -hmm. Um, Product managers that do not have the patience to actually pause their thinking, right? Like you said, instead Mm -hmm. of jumping to the solution, figure out Mm -hmm. first and redefining the problem first Mm -hmm. and not and restraining the, the natural inclination to want to jump to the solution. Mm-hmm. Every, every human, it's human mm-hmm. nature to mm-hmm. want to jump to the solution. Mm-hmm. You want to be that smart person who figures it out, yep. right? Whether you're in a conversation, etc. Mm-hmm. you know, I've fallen prey to this mm-hmm. too many times mm-hmm. myself. But great, the good to great now, right? Mm-hmm. The great product managers that I've interacted with will very rarely jump to conclusions in a discussion. Mm -hmm. but continue to ask more and more questions. And then when they're comfortable, we'll then have a hypothesis, Mm -hmm. right? They withhold their hypothesis until much later in the conversation. Until they have enough information to even put together a hypothesis. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. The opposite is also very bad where they they are like analysis paralysis, uh, which Mm -hmm. is another thing that Mm -hmm. you may want to elaborate about. But even in a a non, let's say we're not discussing uh, numbers or data, Mm -hmm in a specific conversation, but we're talking mm-hmm. about conceptual things about a consumer. Mm-hmm. Even then, that the speed by which that person comes to the conclusion mm-hmm. matters a lot to me. Mm-hmm. It matters a lot to me. Um, yeah, so I thought I would add that part. Any other red flags? Do you have any red flags? Yeah. I, one, fl- one, one question I often ask when I'm interviewing product managers is, um, to talk, ask, I usually ask them to talk about products they like. Right, and this could be, mm. um, you know, it could be an app. Yeah. Uh, it could be uh, hardware. Uh, I mean, it could be like a phone. Um, somebody talked to me about their car, um, and I think one thing is you, you want to look for people who genuinely love products. Right. Yes. They need to love products that solve problems. And it doesn't have to be a tech product. It doesn't. No, it can be any not. product that it they use. It doesn't. I, I had one person uh, uh, talk about his car's mirrors. Wow. Uh, his car's That's side crazy. mirrors. His side mirrors? His side mirrors. And like how uh, how it was placed and angled next to the door that, maxim- that minimized the blind spot. Uh, wow. Um, Why did you love that? Oh, I Why was that great for you? Well, because it, you know, it, it, it combined a lot of different things, right? Like one is that there's an attention to detail, mm-hmm. right? Um, most people, I mean, if you kind of look at your mirrors, you can look behind you, uh, and it prevents you from getting into accidents most of the time. Then you're good, right? It's just a mirror, yeah. right? But then, you know, for somebody to kind of look at the I, mirror, I think most people won't even see it as a product. No, right? No, exactly. They won't yeah. see it as a unit of product. No, mm-hmm. yeah, no. they'll see the car as a product, but not right. that mirror. Yeah, exactly, which is exactly. Yeah, and and so. Uh, most people would, wouldn't even think about it uh, as, a, as a product. Most people wouldn't even think about, like, what is that mirror there to do, right? Mm-hmm. They just kind of seem like, yeah, cars have mirrors. My car is a mirror. Cool, right? Uh, but this person actually mentioned that his car's mirrors were especially good at catching blind spots considering the design of the car, right? And so I, I thought that was great. Uh, I think a lot of people that are, are, are asked this question sometimes just go to whatever is the sexy product of the time, right? Like a few years ago, uh, a lot of people said, oh, I love Snapchat. <laughs> right, uh, uh, but uh, I think it's the ones who can can really explain like, and, and I think saying you love Snapchat is totally valid. Uh, but you know what exactly did Snapchat bring to the table uh, that was new that you know mm-hmm. solved a, a specific problem? Yeah. Um, so you know if somebody would say Snapchat, I think the minimum 
uh, level of kind of uh, explanation that I would expect is, oh, you know, talking about how, you know, the world today in social media, everything is recorded and there's not this concept of like things that are being ephemeral and how it prevents people from living in the moment. And now with this new interface, now you can actually kind of capture those informal moments, which actually represent a majority of human life, mm. that type of stuff, right? Like it's the minimum, the minimum is you expect somebody to really understand like what problem is it solving, not just yeah. kind of like some new sexy feature, yeah. mm -hmm. right? The, the why. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's actually, I actually find that missing actually a lot of times because I think right now there is a certain level of glamour or, or, or sexiness to like product management because you're building cool products that get used by millions of people. Mm -hmm. um, but then you, you miss out right now. What's really hard to find is like people who really love the craft. Yes. Right? That's, and that's, I think, what's... Instead of the glamour. Exactly, right? It's like, it, oh. It is very glamorous. It is. Not, right? uh... You get to tell all your friends. No, no, the work is not glamorous. <laughs> yeah. But to the external world, mm -hmm. it's like, that's my product. It's true. Right? Yes. They get yeah. to say it's my it is, product. It is becoming the dream job for most MBAs now, instead yeah. of that's consulting exactly. or banking. So people that don't know what they want to do, but want to be in tech, they're like, I could be a product manager, right? Yeah. That was me. <laughs> I just happened to be the founder, so I got lucky. I got to step out of that before anyone noticed how bad I was at it. So I, I think that the, you know, what you said about that attention to detail, right? If you asked someone who said, or you're trying to assess someone's writing capability, and you ask them what, you know, how often do you read a book? And the person says, like, I read one book every, like, three months. Mm. Like, that in itself, and, and they, they do a very cursory overview of that book. Like, mm. you're going to have a question mark, right? Yep. Yep. People, yep. you have to love the products that you use for you to to show some potential and how good you would be at building a product mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to demonstrate that you've built one mm -hmm. but you need to demonstrate that you've thought deeply about the products that you do use yes. and understand why absolutely. you love it absolutely right so that self-reflection is a critical mm -hmm. skill it also means that you pay attention to quality that's right yeah not just detail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what what is the next what, what is the business performance rationale to attention to detail? Because quality is all in the details. That's right. right? Yep. Quality is all in the details. It is in the massaging every little part of that experience mm -hmm. in a thoughtful way that adds to the grid, to this amazing experience overall. Yeah, and, and that's hard. It is hard. It is hard. Not, not that many people care, but you can also overshoot that quality by being too detail oriented That's true. Mm -hmm. and there are some product managers that never want to release the product they're like no no it's not ready yeah it's not ready and i'm like get it out like, <laughs> yeah i'm usually on that side of yeah. the yeah. equation because it's good enough it's good enough now i'm pulling back and going to the other side of the equation and saying like no no no, no. this has to be much better when it gets out <laughs> like yeah like no joking around now and so those are the things you're looking at for, for me i have a few things that because I've done some, not as many as you, but I think both of you have done probably more product manager interviews than I have. But what I am looking for in product managers, especially when it's a more senior level, you know, what I'm looking for is actually the ability to think two or three steps ahead. Okay? This is one thing that you know, for me is extremely important because one of the most constant things, constant truths about product management is the unpredictability of your work. Mm -hmm. It is massively unpredictable, okay? And so first of all, if you get shaken by unpredictability very easily, emotionally, don't pick product management, right? The Unless world you've is, read, yeah. yeah, the world is brutal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you know, you, you you do something, you think you're brilliant, and then nobody uses it. Yes, so mm -hmm. you gotta have a tough and then skin. What do you do? <laughs> when do you kill a product? Is... Yeah. Oh man, no. forget about that. It's a whole other podcast. <laughs> trying to kill a product. Oh my god, even the, it's one of the hardest things, by yeah. the way, uh, to kill a product. But I think that 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 mental, first of all, the mental resilience is is, is very very important, but. Because of the unpredictability, people who are very good at contingency planning, if this, then that, 
if that then this, if that then this. Mm -hmm. That creates a calm in the team. That creates the ability to know that if things go wrong, we have a plan B, we have a plan C, plan D. And there are many people that just intuitively don't do this, right? They shoot first from the hip and they don't have this planning capability. So it's this weird combination of comfort with uncertainty, but with the structured planning of mm -hmm. different scenarios, mm -hmm. right? This is the great, the good mm -hmm. to great uh, uh, PM uh, from my perspective. And finally, I would say what I'm looking for when I'm, when I'm interviewing uh, a great product person is a sense of disgust. This is also very important. A sense of disgust at products or services that are just like, this is not up to par mm -hmm. with what I expect from a service like this. Mm -hmm. There is a, so it's not just the, oh, I love great products. There's, there should be also complemented by a sense of, God, this is unacceptable, right? This, is, this level of quality is unacceptable. And without that frustration, I feel like the, the motivation to fix things that are, you know, may not exactly, may not be delightful to the, or may not add to directly the OKR will be very low. Mm -hmm. The quality level, people who have a very high bar of quality will always get frustrated by, by low quality products. Yeah. Right? Even if you don't necessarily do something about it immediately, but you know, that feeling is there. And I can tell when it's there in yes. a person also. Yeah. Like, you just have to tell them, like, describe a product that you hate, right? And then and just see how emotionally mm -hmm. involved they are about it. And that's usually a good sign. Frustrated people with low quality is a good sign. Mm -hmm. Final point that I wanted to just touch upon. Where do you find these great product managers? What's their background? Because, you know, product management is really interesting. We don't hire entry-level product managers, at least now. Gojek doesn't... We, we would never accept someone fresh out of university mm -hmm. with no job experience whatsoever mm -hmm. into a mm -hmm. product manager mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the luxury of hiring people, only people with product management experience, mm -hmm. right? So this is a very interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So where do you find them? What are the professions that are high potential uh, that you've realized? Mm -hmm. Where well, are you looking? You know, when you mentioned those six crafts, right, mm. um, that go into building a product, those are good places to start, I think, because one... Like engineers? Engineers, uh, researchers, designers, right, analysts, um, because usually they have actually already worked with a product manager before, so they're familiar with that role already, so that's a big plus, right? They know what goes into... Um, building a product they just don't know maybe the day-to-day -day skills needed to be a good product manager but at least they have that context already mm. so i think that that's a really good place to start especially if you're looking internally and they, then they also have the company context which is a big big plus I, can you really think an engineer can become a good product manager absolutely yeah yeah and is it what about a consultant what about the non-technical crafts or yeah. like a management consultant or where, where would you look first mm -hmm. if you had, you know, top pick? Where do we look? Honestly, I would cast the net very wide. Some of, mm. I, I just presented on this actually at Tech in Asia. I like put the slide mm. um, on with like six to eight like profiles of like some of the uh, best product managers I know in real life. Um, they've worked for, you know, Google, Facebook, Uber, Kiva, and Change.org, here at Gojek, right? Mm -hmm. And when you look at those backgrounds, wildly different from electrical engineering, right, to software engineering, to something interdisciplinary like um, like symbolic systems at Stanford, look it up, also my major, also yep. Marissa Mayer's major, by the way. Okay. Um, and so someone was a translator, a professional translator. A translator. Yep, before they turn to product management and she's one of the best I know, right? Wow. So there's like no hard and fast formula here. I think you look for those skills, right? That you think would make a good product manager. And then you, you prioritize, I think, areas where you think you're more likely to like be able to find them. So like start with the crafts that are adjacent to product management. Start internally, you know, in your company. 
um, and then start expanding outwards. And uh, management consultants, yes, absolutely. They know they understand business. Some of them have worked with product managers, right? Mm-hmm. So there is no one right answer, I would say. And I mean, you've been in charge of this hiring process and, mm-hmm. and the overall kind of health of the functional organization. How, what are you thinking in terms of home growing product yeah. managers from within the organization itself? I think it needs to be a priority. We just have not had, I think, the structure to support it. Because what you don't want to do, right, is have people transfer in who are not PMs or people who are entry level, right, who uh, join us from outside, and there's no support structure to, like, mentor and grow them. So either they're really struggling, right, to, like, move uh, move up in the org and learn new skills that they need, um, or they just fail, right? Mm-hmm. Either they're like succeeding, but like at a great cost, right, on their own, or they're not succeeding at all when they really potentially could. So, I absolutely think that we should be doing that. Some of the best companies um, that we know in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area do this, right? Like uh, Google's associate product manager program is pretty world famous for like growing some of the best PMs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Facebook has a similar program. Uh, now Uber has built by actually, I think. Uh, one of the PMs who basically grew up within the Google system, right? So mm. I think we absolutely need to start investing in that. Right. Yeah, I think I think the internal the internal one is the internal hire uh, or internal transfer route is is one that's interesting, and, and I, I think we have a few interesting mm-hmm. ones. I know I know mm-hmm. one person. Um, he used to be an operations manager, actually. Um, so his job, I believe, at one point was to just. Uh, 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 basically manage the office and make sure that we could onboard enough drivers. Um, and now um, he's actually a product manager in uh, uh, our, our transportation product group, and he's actually doing really well. And he's one of the rising stars within the organization. Um, so you can find them anywhere. I think. I think the 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 definitely. I think that the probability of conversion and success is probably highest in those kind of adjacent. Um, those adjacent. Uh, crafts, uh, but it seems like the variability is high enough that basically anyone can kind of can kind of do it if they have the right mentality and thought process, mindset, uh, and also importantly, like attitude, right? Like mm-hmm. that humility, for example. I think um, I think one of the there's always and also it also depends on what exactly is the type of product, mm-hmm. right? Like the, some products are more consumer facing, some products are more technical. Um, and it, it also kind of depends, and that's why you know I think this whole field is very interesting because it's a pretty new field for, for uh, especially. I think the concept of a product manager may not be a new one, but the concept of like a software product manager uh, has kind of dramatically changed over the last couple of years, as even the the you know the the form factor has changed primarily to you know like smartphones from 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 you know desktop. Uh, uh, the emergence of um, ML machine learning uh, techniques uh, also means that now that's another component to uh, product managers potential toolkit uh, and so there's like all these like basically as a the, the, the discipline seems to always evolve as technology evolves right because mm-hmm. you're building products that are technology products so that also means that you know because the role is always evolving the types of people who are good fits the types of people that we should be thinking about pushing into the discipline also kind of evolve so it's always it's 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 in very inclusive in one sense but it's also very demanding on uh, on the other so i think the you know the field is is kind of very uh, excitingly vague right for for that purpose yeah i haven't seen too many books on it right there's a bunch of engineering books mm-hmm. and and materials and stuff like that mm-hmm. i think product management is a little bit more niche mm-hmm. right it's cuz it's a little newer especially because it's mobile now it's pretty much all mobile, like at least with, with the, the big, big unicorns. I think I want to end the session, you know, with one thought that, you know, you know how I know that we have great product managers or, you know, when I, and I'm using me in, in general saying like when a CEO or a founder knows that you have great product managers, if you have great product managers, you should feel stupid from time to time as a founder and CEO, yeah, agreed. right? Yeah. That's, that's how you know you've got great product managers. Uh, when you throw out a, an idea that you're so confident about or you throw out 
um, or you or it's a, a rant <laughs> about something uh, that you think you know is so easy to do, and then your product manager calmly and politely explains how you're wrong, and then you feel okay, all right, I should have thought that one through a little bit more, or I should know more about my product. Those are the little indications that your product management organization is doing a great job. When they are able to correct the course of beliefs held by more powerful people in the organization, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's where me personally, my greatest learning with working with great product managers is to always prioritize evidence over belief and to know the difference between the two. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks for Thank coming you. on board. Till next time. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.